Father, um, Romans 9, for about 30 years, 40, maybe 50, has just killed me and set me free. And I pray, Lord God, that this morning you would do some of that for all of us, kill us and set us free. We get so stressed, Lord God, that you might kill people, but I think you kill us all in order to make us new. So, Father, I pray now that we would surrender to your word. I pray that you would help us to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me grab a pulpit here. This is our uh, 23rd sermon from the book of Romans. So if you're, you're new, may God bless your name and connect the dots. Um, Romans, you know, is a letter. So it was meant to be read in, in one sitting. So let me remind you of a few highlights that we've kind of read so far. Romans 3.23, Paul makes this outrageous statement. There is no distinction all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified. Who? The same all, right, the all that, that sinned, justified by grace through redemption in Christ Jesus. Then Paul addresses this, this question. So what's the point of being a Jew? What's the point of being religious if we can't boast? Romans 5.19, Paul circles back around again making this statement. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many, which many? The sinners, right? The sinners will be made righteous. That means justified. Then Paul addresses this question. Well then, shall we just keep on sinning? To all these questions, remember he has that answer, tell no. Romans 8, he circles back around again Verse 29, those whom God foreknew, and who does God not foreknow? I mean, only those that he did not create, right? I would think, like an, a lie or maybe a shadow, an illusion. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That means that we're all predestined to freedom in the very image of God, the image of of his son. In order that he might be, his son, might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Past tense. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? There's another question. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, listen again, gave him up for us all, how will he not also with us graciously give us all things? That means all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. God does the justifying. It's God who justifies, who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us? Another question, from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Yes, but. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, super conquerors. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now he's addressing these questions. Who can condemn us? Who can separate us? And there are some rather obvious responses is that, that maybe deserve a little more consideration. So who can condemn us, Paul? Well, how about your entire nation, Paul? <laughs> you know, those, those guys that led Jesus like a sheep to the slaughter. Uh, those guys that have repeatedly flogged you, imprisoned you, and now they await you in Jerusalem so they can imprison you and ship you off to Rome, hopefully for execution. How about your fellow Israelites, Paul? And yet Paul is an Israelite himself, right? And that raises another question. Can he separate himself 
from God or from himself? Who can separate? Well, how about you, Paul? How about that thing that Americans like to casually call free will? And even if nothing in all creation can separate or will be able to separate, why do I feel so separated right now? Why school shootings in Texas? Why war in Ukraine? Why the anxiety, the depression, the anguish, the travail, and deep sorrow? Next verse in the letter, Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, huiothesia, the thing we've been talking about for several weeks, the glory, the covenants, that would be the old and the new, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises, which must include the promise, right? To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Next verse. But it is not as though the word, the logos of God, has failed. Now stop for a moment. Because this is the huge perplexing question throughout all of Scripture. And it's the reason for the anguish in your soul. You know about the word of God. You know about the word of God. You long for the word of God, even if you don't, wouldn't put it in those in that term, in those words, but, but it seems, doesn't it? It seems as if the word of God has failed. This is the word of God hanging on a tree in a garden around about the sixth hour of the day, sixth day of the week, the end of the sixth day of creation. You know, in Genesis 1, God speaks a word and reality happens until on the seventh day it is finished and everything that's anything is good. But on the sixth day, God speaks that word, saying, let us make Adam, mankind, in our own image. But we're mankind. We're Adam. And we're not so finished. We're not so good. So Paul is asking, why do we know about the good, and yet we just aren't so good? Why does it seem that the word of God has failed? Why have so many Jews refused to repent and believe the king of the Jews and his gospel? Verse 6, it is not as though the logos of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, more literally translate, not all those or that of Israel are Israel. And now stop again and examine your heart. If you're, if you're like me, the very moment you read that verse or heard that verse, something happened. What happened? You accessed a little bit of the knowledge of good and evil that you acquired somewhere, you're not sure where, and you immediately began to ask this question, Whoa, where is the line between good and evil? Who's in and who's out? Who has chosen the good and who has chosen the evil? Who is the Israel of God? If not the first, it's one of my very first memories. I went ice skating with my new friend from kindergarten Ray Hayes and his family. And while we were ice skating, Ray f fell down and his mother, his mother of all people, she looked at him and she, she laughed and she said, Ray, you, you fell on your butt. And immediately, I thought, she's evil. 
She's going to hell, whatever that means. And I better not be Ray's friend. You see, my dad was a pastor. And in my house, but was one of the unspeakable words. And we all wanted to please Jesus. And, and let me say, my parents were not bad. They were incredibly good. It is very important for little children to learn the knowledge, to gain the knowledge of good and evil. You know, the kids up the street from my house, they not only said but, they said the unspeakable potty word, S-H-I-T. They said it. And sometimes they said the mother of all unspeakable words. At my house, it was the, the mother of them all. Actually a phrase, actually a theological proclamation. God damn it. Tim Wren, Billy Newcomb, Jimmy Lovegrove, they used to call me Mr. Decent because I would not speak the unspeakable words. And whenever one of them said, God damn it, I would think, yep, they're evil. They're going to hell. And the line between good and evil, well, that line runs right between me and them. <sighs> the bad people. In my mind, I really thought that they were like another tribe, another race, or another species. I mean, I remember thinking this way. I could not imagine that their interior world was anything at all like my interior world, and so I, I drew a line. Now, I would never say the unspeakable phrase, God damn it, or God damn them, and yet, and yet I kind of expected God to damn them and sort of even like the thought, damning them and not me. I drew a line. And it's drawing those lines that often keeps us safe, both physically and psychologically. Years later, I discovered that Tim died alone in a hotel room in Bangkok, Thailand, <laughs> probably from a drug overdose. You see, Tim wasn't safe. Tim was a danger to me, or what I thought was me. If you're Ukrainian and you hear a man speaking some words in Russian, drawing a line between yourself and that man might just save your skin. And drawing some lines can save your psyche. That's why we blame others. That's why I blame Susan. Because blaming yourself, what? That causes psychological pain. Drawing the line can save your psyche and actually whole groups of similar psyches. Sociologists call this scapegoating after the Hebrew practice of placing all of the sins of Israel on, on, a, on a goat and then releasing that goat into the wilderness of Azazel on the Day of Atonement. You can bind entire countries and people groups together by placing all perceived sins upon a scapegoat and, and then drawing the line between you and evil between your group and the scapegoat. Of course, politicians and mass media outlets do this all the time. That's why our government doesn't function anymore. Democrats and Republicans are all scapegoating. And of course, politicians learn it from their pastors and their rabbis. For the real pros at taking the knowledge of good and evil, judging some out and others in, the real pros at scapegoating and tribal thinking are not the tax collectors, but the who? The Pharisees. Pharisees don't simply judge people's actions, they judge souls, and they don't simply send people to jail, they damn them to hell. Paul wrote, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And yet Jesus said we all must become like little children to enter the kingdom. The thing that makes a child childish is thinking that he or she has already grown up. To become like a child is not to become an adult acting childish, but to give up your childish judgments, humble yourself, and, and learn things that you did not already know. It is to be what you actually are, a little child. I drew the line, I drew the line between good and evil, between me and Ray Hayes' mom, and between me and Tim Wren and Billy Newcomb and Jimmy Lovegrove. But every summer we go to my grandpa's farm. And yes, that is actually a live deer behind my grandpa in the living room. 
And that's my, my grandpa. And my grandpa didn't just say, but. My grandpa said, shit, hell, and God damn it to hell. In each and every sentence. It was, I mean, seriously, it was spectacular. If you ever do go to hell and you find yourself wondering, why is this place chock full of old tractors and irrigation equipment from Nebraska in the 1970s? Well, it's because my grandpa, Ralph Sperling, sent it all there. He damned it all to hell. Well, I wanted to draw the line between good and evil between me and my grandpa because he kind of scared me. But this was, this was the problem. Grandpa loved me. He'd say, oh, hell, Peter, you come on over here. And let me just give you a hug. And he'd hug the hell out of me. He dug me so tight I thought he'd turn me inside out, and I suppose he did. But I'm not so sure that I ever really let Grandpa hug me. In high school, I tried to convert Grandpa. And he said, oh, hell, Peter, they're all the same. They all say a different thing, and then they argue. And I, I knew what he meant. The Protestants say the Catholics are out and they're in, and, and the Catholics say no, they're in, and the Protestants are out. They each draw the line between their tribe and every other tribe. I think I would do just uh, about anything to go back in time, become a little child, give up my childish ways, sit on my grandpa's lap, and just let him hug me. So where do you draw the line between good and evil? Do you draw it between Republicans and Democrats? Between liberals and conservatives? Between the rich and the poor? Maybe between Russians and Ukrainians? How about between 18-year-old boys that shoot up elementary schools and, you know, all the others, the others that make fun of boys like Salvador Ramos and then wish them to hell and they rejoice when he goes there, according to them? Do you draw the line between Christians and non-Christians? As if you could judge, as if you could know what one of them actually was or were, however you conjugate that verb. Jesus made it abundantly clear that there is good and evil. But he also seemed to indicate that we're just piss poor at drawing the line between the two. And he told us that if we try to uproot the, the weeds, we'll also uproot the wheat, the fruit. And where did he draw the line? Do you remember what he said to Peter, his right-hand guy, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17? He said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Wow. And do you remember what he said to Peter just a moment later in Matthew 16, verse 23? He turned it, looked at Peter, and said, Get behind me, Satan. For years, I've been haunted by a statement from, in a wonderful way, by a statement from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Soviet dissident, in his book, The Gulag Archipelago. This is what he wrote. And it was only when I lay there on rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first stirrings of good. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. And yet Paul writes, not all those of Israel are Israel. What the hell, to quote my grandpa, is Paul saying? When we hear Israel, we think of a country, right, in the Middle East, and a whole bunch of wars. But when Paul wrote Romans about 20 years after the death of Jesus, there had been no nation of Israel that went by the nation of Israel since 722 BC. That's 775 years before Paul wrote to the Romans. And even then, that Israel was not all of Israel. You know the story, the 10 northern tribes split from Judah, the southern tribe, and the little tribe of Benjamin that went with Judah. They split about 200 years even before that. So that's 970, almost 1,000 years before Paul writes the book of Romans. So some might think that Paul is saying some tribes of Israel aren't Israel. And 
actually, the tribe of Judah said that about the northern ten tribes, that they were not the real Israel. In fact, those that were left behind, they referred to as Samaritans, at least in Jesus' day. But in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, Paul wrote, God shows no partiality. In 3, 9, he asks, are we, and he was talking about the Jews, that's the Israelites of the tribe of Judah, and then his little tribe, Benjamin, are we any better off? And he answered, no. Verse 22, there is no distinction. In the Revelation, the names of the 12 tribes are on the 12 gates of New Jerusalem. Jesus picks 12 disciples, like the 12 tribes. It sure would seem that all the tribes of Israel are Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel sees a valley of dry bones come to life, and God says to Ezekiel, this is the whole house of Israel, the whole house. In two chapters, Paul's going to write, and so all Israel will be saved. But here in chapter 9, verse 6, Paul doesn't appear to be speaking of tribes of Israel or individual persons of Israel. He's just spoken about Israelites, pronounced Isra Elites in Greek, but now he does not write, not all Israelites are of Israel. He writes, not all those of Israel are Israel, or not all that of Israel is Israel, not all Israel is Israel. See, it helps me to remember that Paul is probably not talking about a country or tribes or individuals as such. He's talking about a particular man named Israel which is fairly obvious, for next he talks about the man Abraham, and after that, the man Isaac, Abraham's son, and after that, the man Jacob, Isaac's son, who was renamed Israel by the God-man that wrestled him at the edge of the promised land, wrestled the hell out of him and heaven into him, and then named him Israel. But it's true that Paul also must be thinking about the sons of Israel, as well as Israel, but in that culture, a son was like an extension of a particular man. And in the Bible, all the sons of Israel are with Israel in the end, in which case saying not all of Israel is Israel is a lot like saying not all of Peter Hyatt is Peter Hyatt. There's a true Peter and a false Peter. That's what we've been talking about for nine months. There's a, a new Peter and there's an old Peter. There is a Peter that God has already made. And there's a Peter that Peter thinks he is making. There is Peter the child. And then there's the childish Peter that thinks he's already grown up. There is Peter. And there is the poop that comes from Peter. But Peter's not the poop. Remember we talked about that. There is Peter in the spirit. And Peter of the flesh who eats life and poops death. Put it the other way around, there is Peter that is born of, of, of water. Remember, we're, we all, when we're born in this world, the water breaks, we're born of the water. When we're born in the next world, we take a breath of spirit in, in a new reality. There's Peter that is already even born of the spirit. There is Peter, and there is the umbilical cord to which Peter clings. There is Peter, and there is the fig leaves that Peter wears, which he likes to think is himself. There is Peter, and there is Peter's foreskin, the foreskin of Peter. Sorry! That's just biblical truth. Deal with it. Another way to say it, there is Peter the grain, and there's Peter the chaff, the casing around the grain. There is Peter the sheep, that follows the master because he wants to, and Peter the goat that's driven by the master. There's Peter the wheat, and Peter the weed, the tear, the imitation wheat. There's Peter the child of God, and there's Peter the offspring of the devil. There's Peter the anointed, that's Christ in Greek, and Peter the antichrist, the imitation Christ. There's Peter who is not Peter, but Christ in Peter, and there is Peter the, the tupas, the empty vessel that gets filled with the blood of the Christ, Jesus the Christ. There is Peter whom God has made, and there is the Peter that Peter thinks he himself has made, his ego. There is Peter, and there is an illusion, a dream, which Peter is dreaming about Peter. There's Jesus, God is salvation, and then there's Mises, what I have produced believing me is salvation. There is God's choice, and then there's my choice, God damn it. There is good, 
and there is evil, and they're both called Peter. Not all of Peter is Peter. And now I hope that this guy reminds you of this guy. That's the old Adam pregnant with the, the new Adam. And I hope this guy reminds you of this guy. Remember, this is the, the hot mess that we all are right now in between the other two. And I hope that you are being reminded of all that we've preached in Romans for the last nine months. I mean, what if every good decision in me is like the decision of God in me? Like one of these red dots. Like each red dot is a decision of faith, hope, or love. And what if every one of my own decisions is like one of these black dots in me? My own independent will, what some people would call free will. That's my will, free of God's will. What if every red dot is the good, God's judgment, and every black dot is the evil? Just like every little child. You see, I've learned that there is good and evil, but I can barely even begin to draw the line between the two. And when I do, I just end up ripping up the wheat and making more room for for the weeds, the tares, that is the not fruit of the Spirit, the imitation fruit of the Spirit, that is the work of the flesh, the offspring of the devil, the incarnation of the lie, the manifestation of my, manifestation of my independent will, my will independent of God's will, what some people call free will, which isn't actually free, but absolute bondage, bondage to an illusion, which in fact is the outer darkness in which men weep and gnash their teeth. What if? Romans 9, verse 6. But it's not as though the logos of God, the promised seed, that is, Jesus has failed, for not all that or those, that of Israel, is Israel. And not all are children, techna, of Abraham, because they are his offspring. Now, offspring or descendant is a terrible translation, even if we think that sounds better to prudes and church folk. The Greek is abundantly clear. The, the Greek word is sperma, and it has a rather obvious translation. Seed, or even more obvious, sperm. Verse 6, not all that of Israel is Israel. And not all the children of Abraham uh, are all, not all our children of Abraham because they are his sperm. But through Isaac shall your sperma be named. Now, I don't know how many of you fellows have ever tried to name your sperm. Can I just see a show of hands? It's incredibly difficult. Why? Well, because there are just so many of them. And every one of them is so incredibly small, like kind of a little red dot. Imagine all of Abraham's seed. What, like 85 years, uh, you know, giving it a shot? Then when he's 100 years old, there's this one seed named Isaac, which means laughter. And he didn't name it. And it's not entirely clear that this seed even came from Abraham. It's the promised seed, the blessing, and the birthright. Genesis 18, Yahweh appears to Abraham in the form of three men, or, or one man and two angels. They're on their way to destroy Sodom. And Abraham's going to argue with him about that, and hopefully we'll get to talk about that later. Well, well this God-man, this, this God-man, uh, the one or maybe the three, uh, this God-man who Paul seems to refer to as the promise, who is Yahweh, says, says this, I will return, I will return, and Sarah, 90-year-old Sarah, I'll turn next year about this time, and 90-year-old Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah laughs, Sahak in Hebrew, but God is the last laughed, Itzhak, Isaac, within Sarah. <laughs> Not all are children, Tekna, of Abraham, because they are his sperm. Not all of Abraham is Abraham, but through Isaac shall your sperm be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise, like the promise has children. The children of the promise are counted as sperm. For this is what the promise said, like a talking promise, or, or literally, this is what the word, uh, this is the word of the promise. About this time next year, I, the promise, will return, and Sarah shall have a son. 
And then Paul writes, and not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man. Now, man is also a terrible translation, even though it's more acceptable to prudes and church folks. The Greek word is koitin, for which there's an obvious translation, and that is coitus. Verse 10, and not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived by one sex act with our forefather, our forefather, Paul's writing to Romans, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or evil, in order that God's, why? In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Not hate, but, but hated. Now, of course, we all freak out, and we're going to have to ask, what on earth does it mean for God, who is love, to have hated? But for now, let me remind you that Paul has just returned to his original statement, uh, because Jacob becomes Israel, right? After wrestling the God-man at the edge of the promised land, and right before meeting Esau, the firstborn, from whom he stole the blessing and took the birthright through extortion. Esau, who then greets Jacob in the promised land with grace, and Jacob replies, seeing your face is like seeing the face of God, whom he had just wrestled all night long. (laughs) You see, Paul assumes that his readers are not biblically illiterate. And he assumes that they take the Bible seriously, which means that they won't take one sentence out of context and then use that sentence to tell whatever story they would like to tell. Scripture is a story God is telling. And so, uh, by the way, reality is this story that God is telling. (laughs) That's what reality is, the story God is telling. Well, as we've learned, Scripture includes knowledge of good and evil, that is, law and ethics, and yet that's all part of a story about this word that is a seed and a bunch of women, Eve, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Tamar, Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabitess, Bathsheba, Mary, Paul, and us, all hoping to get pregnant with that seed. What seed? The seed of the woman that will crush the head of the ancient dragon. Eternal life. You know, I really think that if we pay attention, we'll discover that the Bible is a story that makes the Lord of the Rings, the Game of Thrones, and all other stories just boring in comparison. And check this out. The Bible is true. And it's the story of you. Now, let me just remind you of the part of the story that Paul just mentioned, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we'll have to talk about details at another time. Well, the the story reveals that not all of Abraham is Abraham. And you remember, or all of Abram is Abraham, however you want to say that, but you remember that Paul wrote extensively about Abraham in Romans 4 when he explained what? Justification by grace through faith, which is the promised seed within Abraham. Not all of Abraham is Abraham. With his own will and exertion, Abraham tries to manufacture the blessing and the promise, and what does he produce? Eliezer, his slave. He produces a slave. Eliezer, Uh, is his name, but in the days of of Jesus, the name was uh, pronounced Lazarus. And Abraham produces Ishmael because his bride pimped her slave Hagar so she could then claim Hagar's baby as her own. How do you like that? Eliezer and Ishmael symbolize Abraham's effort, but Isaac is a miracle. And we wonder, well, what becomes of Lazarus, separated from Abraham's bosom thousands of years ago? And what becomes of Ishmael, which means God sees? Well, then check this out. Not all of Isaac is Isaac. Esau is the firstborn of these twins in the womb, the firstborn, 
and Jacob means heel grabber, usurper, or cheat. Esau is his father Isaac's favorite. He's the favorite of Isaac, but Esau doesn't value his own birthright and so is easily extorted by his conniving little brother with whom he trades the birthright for soup. Imagine. And then his mom helps his little brother Jacob cheat him out of his blessing, the blessing of the firstborn. And why does all this happen? Well, not because Isaac, Rebekah, Esau, or Jacob chose, but because God chose Jacob and not Esau. And so we wonder, what becomes of Esau? Who is also then becomes Edom, the nation of Edom, which uh, in the Hebrew of that day is the very same word as the word Adam. And check this out. Not all of Jacob is Israel. Not all of Israel is Israel, the true Israel. And Jacob has plenty of seed. He has two wives, actually sisters, who pimp their slave girls trying to produce a greater blessing for themselves. I mean, his house, the house of Israel, is literally a brothel. And all 12 of his sons fight for the blessing and the birthright. Jealous of Joseph, they sell their brother into slavery in Egypt. The firstborn, Reuben, he loses the birthright for having sex with his brother's mom and dad's concubine, Rachel's slave. So Israel then gives the birthright and the blessing to the sons of Joseph. But the promised seed goes through Judah, who is tricked into coitus with his daughter-in-law Tamar. The seed eventually passes through a bunch of people, through David and Bathsheba, and not all of David is David. And then it goes on to Solomon, who carries the seed, but he isn't the seed. They thought maybe he's the seed, but he's only part seed. I mean, not all of Solomon is Solomon. It continues through the house of David, of the tribe of Judah, of the man Israel. And check this out. It turns out that not only Esau was hated. Listen closely. Through the prophet Isaiah, God tells the Israelites that, quote, he began to hate them just after they crossed the Jordan. Psalm 5.5, David writes, the proud will not stand before your eyes, Yahweh. You hate all evildoers. So have you ever done evil? That means you're an evildoer. Are you ever proud? You see, it sounds like God began to hate the arrogant, evil you from the day you were baptized at the Jordan, the edge of the promised land. The prophet Isaiah sees God high and lifted up in Isaiah 6. And there he is commissioned to preach a word, a word that will, I mean, everybody loves Isaiah 6 till they read what he's supposed to preach, a word that will burn all of Israel down to a stump, as if Israel is a cursed tree. Then Isaiah 6, 13, the holy seed is its stump. Not all of Israel is Israel. All that seed is not the promised seed. And Israel is burned down to an unwed peasant girl named Mary. Most likely of the house of Judah. Betrothed to a man who is of the house of Judah. And yet, get this, named Joseph. And the seed doesn't even come through Joseph. It comes through a word. Mary, you are highly favored. And then Mary's response, may it be done unto me according to your word. And you know the story. The house of Judah, the Jews, make Jesus their scapegoat. And they crucify their king, the king of the Jews. But he delivers up his spirit, which then begins to fall on all the children of Adam, all the nations, all the peoples of the world, including Lazarus, Ishmael and the Arabs, and Esau and all of Edom, Adam. It's the fulfillment of the promise. God said to Abram, back in Genesis chapter 12, Abram, I will bless you, and in you all the nations of the world will be blessed. That includes all of Israel. Yahweh will again, now check out this language, Yahweh will again choose Israel, Isaiah chapter 14. So Israel, like Esau, is rejected in time and yet chosen for all eternity, rejected and elected. All the nations of the world, that includes all of Israel, and all of Judah, and even Judas, 
For on the cross, Jesus descends into Hades and sets the captives free, including his friend who kissed him in the garden. He sets you free. Why? Because you chose it in freedom? No. Because you're predestined for freedom. In other words, the word of God has not failed, but will accomplish and has accomplished that for which he was sent. Isaiah chapter 55. That for which he was sent. Adam, humanity in the image and likeness of God, who is love. And now this is what's so shocking, insulting, and utterly liberating in all those just crazy, outrageous Old Testament stories. It's not our choices that create the promise. It's the promise that creates our every good choice, our every free choice, every decision of faith, hope, and love in each and every one of us. It's the promise that creates us in the image and likeness of God, who is love. So, so seriously, when you get a chance, give Genesis just a good read, a good honest read, and I think you'll be shocked, disgusted, and amazed. <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all like faithless turds who literally, I'm not speaking figuratively, they, they literally pimp their wives. You can read about that. But, I mean, it's just crazy. They pimp their wives to save their own tail. They cheat their families, all in an effort to take the good who is the promise. They're faithless. They are a perfect depiction of human will and exertion. But when they fail at taking the promise and see that the promise is still given, the promise begins to change all their choices until they each become an image of Jesus, who is what? God's will and God's exertion. At the tree in the garden, we all attempted to steal the birthright. And what happened? Jesus gave us the birthright. Crying, Father, forgive, and into your hands I commit my spirit, the spirit of the firstborn, that we might also be born, born not only of the flesh, but born of his spirit. You see, we cannot make love. But when we surrender to love, love makes us. And even that surrender is 100% mercy. And that is the point of election. Not that some are elect and others are not elect, but that God elects and you don't. Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice? Is this not right? Literally unrighteousness on God's part? Hell no, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion. Let me say that again. So then, this is the point, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then... He has mercy on whomever, whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. For now, let me just point out that not only Pharaoh, but every Israelite had a hard heart. And to every Israelite, God made a promise. In the words of Ezekiel 36, I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and cause you to walk in my way. He hardens all of Israel. He hardens all of humanity at a tree in a garden, verse 18. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. In other words, God is absolutely free. And his will is his word. Which means that Jesus is the free will of God Almighty. He has mercy on whomever he wills. So on whom, this is the huge question, on whom does he will to have mercy? Romans eleven thirty two, 32, the pinnacle of Paul's argument, 
He consigned all to disobedience. That's the hardening, right? He consigned all to disobedience in order that he may have mercy on all. In, in other words, God did this not because he had to do this, but because he chose to do this. He is free will, and he is free to set all of his children free if he wants to. And so he lifted his head and he cried, Father, forgive them. And now brace yourself, all you Americans. We don't have a vote. It's his choice. It's not our choice. In fact, I don't think we really even have any choice, not any good free choice, until God gives us his choice. Up until then, we're just being childish. We think we're free, but we're only like three. Three years old, pretending to be adults, playing house in our father's backyard. We don't have a choice until he gives us a choice. And so what is his choice? What is God's free will? <sighs> Dan Cook used to do this great little comedy routine. Uh, um, he, he says in his comedy routine, I was at the movies and these kids behind me in the theater, they were just talking and talking and talking. It was really pissing me off. I was just about to turn around and yell at him when I saw my WWJD bracelet. What would Jesus do? So I turned around, set them all on fire, and I sent them straight to hell. Yeah, when I heard that, I laughed. And then I started to cry. And I don't think I've, I don't think I've stopped crying about that. Because where did Dane Cook get an idea like that? I suspect he got it from church. A church that uses the word but refuses to surrender to the word and give birth to the word. The harlot. Not the bride. You see, the word himself, according to Scripture, the word himself is the fire. According to Scripture, he descends into hell, into Hades, and according to Scripture, sets the captives free. Why? Because he wants to. That's his choice. It's called love. People always want to know, what's difference? what difference, Peter, does this, this make? Well, just after Paul writes, he consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all, he writes Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So if the seed has taken root in the soil of your heart, if the word has found its place in the sanctuary of your soul, if, you're, if your will is free, then you'll begin to look around. You'll begin to look around for anyone who seems to be trapped by hell or on their way to hell or even in hell, and you'll begin to pray something like this. Yahweh, Lord God, set me on fire with your love and send me there to be with them, to be with Grandpa. In hell, if that's where he is. And if it be your will, and if this is necessary, you could even send me in his place. You know, Paul began chapter 9 with a statement that I used to think he couldn't have actually meant. It's usually translated, I could have wished. More literally, it's translated, I wished. Or I have been wishing I myself to be anathema. That's an utterly fascinating word. It means a devoted offering, a sacrifice. I myself to be anathema from the Christ for my brothers, the Israelites. We well, see, I think I, that Paul answered, I think God answered that prayer because it wasn't just Paul that prayed that prayer. It was the sacred seed, the holy sperm, the will of God. It was love, incarnate, in Paul. Paul gave his life for Israel. That is, the Israelites that would arrest him soon after 
he wrote Romans and then eventually ship him off to Rome. And, and we aren't sure of the details on all this, but he was killed. But now Paul is sitting at a great banquet <laughs> with all of them, all of his brothers laughing in freedom. And in this way, all of Israel and all of Adam will be saved. For the chosen one, the promised seed, the Israel of God took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And then he took the cup, saying, this cup is the covenant in my blood. It's a marriage covenant. <laughs> you are the bride. We are the bride. And this is the seed. And Jesus, I, I think we can't even hope to believe except because you're hoping in us. And that's faith. And that's belief. And that's like a little red dot of love. And you are love. And nothing is more powerful than you. Not even me. Amen. And so if uh, anybody ever says to you, hey, Peter used to be a Presbyterian, so does he believe in double predestination? Well, I think you can say, yeah. He believes that God subjected creation to futility, like Paul says in Romans chapter 8. He believes that God consigned all men to disobedience. He believes that God stuck an ignorant three-year-old, very ch childlike, incomplete Adam and Eve in a garden with an evil talking snake and this weird tree. God doesn't do evil. Uh, but I think he did predestine Peter to know about evil because he also predestined Peter to know the good. <laughs> you see, maybe, um, well, I think this is the truth. We're all predestined to learn about evil in time so that we can know the good, enjoy the good, celebrate the good in absolute freedom for all eternity. And what's the good? <laughs> well, that's the life. That's the one hanging on the tree. So believe the gospel. And if you believe the gospel, and I believe you all do a little bit, because you're beginning to experience this. At first, you experience it maybe with a close friend or a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad or kids. You, you've, you've begun to experience this thing, and that is that you see a person who looks like they're in hell or they're on their way to hell. And I believe there is an outer darkness after these bodies are destroyed. But you see that person and something in you wants to pray, Yahweh, set me on fire with your love and send me to them because I want to be with them. You see, that's not just you. That's the Spirit of God in you. That's love in you. That's Christ in you. That's the Holy Sperm. <laughs> so believe the gospel. You'll become the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like a prayer, I think members of the prayer team would be down front and they would love to pray with you. Have a great day.